Welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us for the next lecture in the Youth Investment Readiness Program. We're thrilled today that we have Javier Munoz Blanco with us. He's going to be talking to us today about stakeholder management and partners, which I know is going to be a key part to all of you realizing your nonprofit or social business goals. So without further ado, over to Javier. Um, thank you very much, Lauren, and um, uh, for he every, uh, hello to everyone, and uh, I must say that I'm very glad to be here. I'm very honored to, to participate in this program and to be able to share with you uh, some of the insights that come with this, uh, with this program and with the work that I do and with the learnings that I've been uh, picking up from different experiences. Um, so as, uh, as Lauren said, like, my name is Javier uh, Munoz Blanco, uh, and I'm a sustainability consultant at, at Demuser, uh, and I'm doing right now the, two, two consultancies, one, one for FAO on SDGs, uh, SDG implementation in the Caribbean, and another one with UNDP uh, with, uh, uh, on environmental governance. So in that sense, uh, those two consultancies that I'm currently doing basically mix the importance of SDGs with the importance of governance. And governance has to be done considering stakeholder, stakeholders and partners. Um, so uh, I've, been, uh, I've been following the program, of course, uh, the investor investment readiness program, and I've seen that like uh, you've already been doing like very quite technical work on uh, when it comes to investment proposition, Pitch training, uh, SDG impact, impact assessment, uh, uh, marketing, revenue models, and so on. And um, and I'm sure you're really full of models that, uh, that illustrate and, and guide you through many steps of the way of uh, starting uh, an initiative. That idea can be a non-profit, a for-profit, the social for-profits, uh, social impact investment, or environmental impact investment, investment both, and so on. Um, so the, the approach that I wanted to bring here, it uh, comes from this, this kind of uh, subheading that comes from the, the Investment Readiness Program of accelerating youth-led uh, solutions for the SDGs and boosting impact investment through a hands-on collaborative approach. Um, so this part of SDGs and collaborative is the one that I want to bring in. Uh, in this presentation, and uh, and this presentation is going to be composed of this uh, 11, uh, 11 stages. Um, first, why are we doing this? Why are we even talking about this? Uh, what is the relation with the 2030 agenda? Uh, and then I'm going to use a model that uh, I'm going to present later on that has five forces. Uh, the, this model, uh, I have to say, this is going to be just a guide. Uh, I'm not uh, claiming that this is the, the perfect explanation of the model. There, are, there have been many scholars who have already, including the author himself, they have already given interpretations uh, from the very business uh, M MBA uh, 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 point of view to this model, uh, with its good and its bad, and what it, when it's useful and when it's not. But I think it's a good um, framework to for us to start thinking of our stakeholders and, and our possible partners. Then I'm going to illustrate one bad example of something that uh, we could be doing, but maybe that shouldn't be necessarily uh, desirable. And then a conclusion and, uh, and just mentioning uh, what the uh, practical exercise will be. Uh, so um, the, the first question is, uh, why are we addressing this issue at all? Um, and this comes from, uh, uh, we many times talk about stakeholders, for example, uh, when you were uh, in the UN itself, uh, they usually talk as stakeholders as government, the first one, civil society, uh, uh, private sector, and so on. But we, uh, in this case, we are not such big players, so we don't usually uh, have a stakeholder or as a direct stakeholder, someone we have meetings with. Uh, we don't have the government. We don't. Or if we have the government, it would be a municipality. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be. We are not that big, and it's it's fine because there are, we have to work on the SDGs on different levels, and uh, this uh, smaller level uh, is is uh, as necessary as the big one. Um, but like uh, when we are uh, like when you are <laughs> in this situation, you have your idea, you want to put it through. Uh, you you. You find out the stakeholder management is a complex complex issue. There are so many things. I mean, apart from the uh, from the legal framework and for the other people who are already doing what you're doing and the possible people who might be doing something similar, your even your partners, even internal stakeholders, 
uh, your social base. Uh, managing all that is, is difficult and requires different uh, skills that some of them are soft skills that come not from learning a lot in a university, but rather trying to be more empathetic, trying to be more uh, reading and having more self-critical and having critical analysis and so on. Uh, the second issue of why we are addressing this, um, uh, because in many projects and in many initiatives, uh, stakeholder management is not usually taken as a, as a big priority. And of course, it, one could understand that because we are talking uh, of finance issues. Uh, we, are, we have to find money to even start. We, we need resources, we need people to support us. Uh, but at the same time, um, we might have the best idea, we might have the best players, if we don't know who to play with, who to deal with, how to deal with them, it's going to be difficult anyway. Uh, and the third one, I think that might be just to, to bring a misconception that might come uh, from the SDGs, that many times we talk of, on the SDGs of, of course, implementing the SDGs will benefit everyone, uh, one way or another. Um, but when we are talking of a, a, a smaller level, uh, we have something that is competition, and that's something that we still cannot avoid. Uh, I mean, of course, we should be promoting collaboration, but we, when we are starting, not everyone's going to work in our benefit. No, not everyone's going to support us directly, or, or not everyone's going to see an incentive to support us directly. So sometimes win-win-win situations, uh, these three wins means you, your idea, and the people who might benefit from that, and the people who might be competing with you, uh, those situations are not always possible. Sometimes some people will have uh, a worse situation. It might be powerful people who shouldn't have a, a, a very powerful people who shouldn't have a very high position in the first place. So that situation of everyone winning might not be possible and we have to be critical on how to deal with that. Um, so why is this topic of uh, uh, stakeholder partners, uh, stakeholders and partner management uh, important and it has some relation with the 2030 agenda. Well, the first thing and the most evident one, there's already one SDG, the SDG 17 that actually refers to it. It refers to it and to many other things I have to point out. Uh, SDG 17 talking just about partnerships is a bit imprecise. It had to be, it had to be named in, in, in a way, but it, uh, SDG 17 also encompasses issues that have to do with international trade, that have to do with data, that have to do with uh, policy coherence. But nevertheless, there's one SDG that uh, explicitly recognizes that we have to work with other people to improve things. Uh, the main link to the 2030 agenda that comes with stakeholders and partners management comes from the 2030 agenda principles uh, of inter uh, universality, integration, and leaving no one behind. And this is where, like, uh, I'm going to be bringing this, these three principles up during the presentation because I think it's very important that we keep them in mind to basically to everywhere, everything that we do with, with our work, including our initiative. Uh, the principle of universality states that every country or you know, everyone is responsible in a way to implement the 2030 agenda. And that includes our, our idea, our initiative, our, and the people that we involve with it. The second principle is the principle of integration, that we have to be resource efficient when doing that and trying to break the silos and trying to break the barriers that, that hinder collaboration. Um, so in that sense, uh, not only we have to be efficient with our idea, we have to be efficient with, every, with the possible people we, we can work with. Um, sometimes just be integrating with someone else might bring us to markets or to uh, 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 an, an audience or to a, 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 a possible uh, target uh, target market in a way that like not almost no money in the world could bring. Just for example, being friends with someone can open the doors for many things. And, and being friends, I don't mean in the, in the corruption way, just being befriending people brings people together as well. And the third one, and this is a very important one that I would, uh, the, most people in the UN basically highlight that this is the most important 2030 agenda principle that is leaving no one behind. Uh, and with our idea, we should be conscious and aware of what are the impacts of our idea. We want to improve, uh, <laughs> we, we want to improve the situation of a particular topic with our idea, with our initiative. Uh, but while doing so, we might, um, come across situations that might, uh, uh, they might reduce the, the livelihood of someone, that might uh, 
impacted someone negatively and we should be aware who those people are and if uh, we're being inclusive when we are hiring when we are buying uh, from suppliers and and so on and the third link with the 2030 agenda is something that is called sdg or 2030 agenda localization and that stands for implementing uh, the, uh, the 2030 agenda at the subnational level uh, what happens in, in countries within themselves are very are, are quite unequal. Usually, capital cities are richer are the richest places. Uh, rural areas are the many times might lack in, uh, infrastructures. They might lack uh, um, access to, for example, jobs or livelihoods. And, uh, and it, so, in that sense, the the type of how we implement the 2030 agenda is different from rich areas or high income areas in a country to the ones that, that, have, that have it worse off. So with our idea, we have to be able, we should be able to uh, use our idea to solve problems targeted and tailor-made to different situations at the national level. Or in our markets, we might have to discriminate. Uh, what I mean discriminate is differentiate our different targets uh, that might be impacted by our idea. Uh, so coming for, for the five forces uh, analysis, and this is a model uh, that um, Michael Porter uh, uh, described and uh, uh, came up with uh, in 1979. Uh, this model has been discussed uh, for, for a long time in, uh, in, in academia, in, uh, in business, or in, uh, in MBA schools and so on. And um, and I think, although it has some detractors, it has it has had criticisms. It, it doesn't always apply. I think it's a simple enough analysis for us to to work, especially when we have uh, when we are in this uh, in, uh, investment program in which we have to learn many things many things in in a, in, in a very short time. It's easier to have simpler models that might be a bit imprecise than having something very comprehensive that we might not understand. Uh, so in that sense, what I'm going to do with this model is uh, transform it into a, uh, take the, its components and analyze them from an SDG perspective uh, with a critical perspective for you to consider once uh, you are talking with different uh, of these forces. Um, I have to say that not everyone, uh, like the, it, these forces don't include everyone that is, should be your stakeholder or your partner. There are many people from your from civil society, uh, from governments, uh, uh, government institutions, and so on that are not included here. But I think this one could uh, help you start with the key ones that you should consider from a business or from a financial sustainability perspective through the process of having a, a product or an initiative or a project that works. Um, so the first force, and it's what we talk, uh, what we mention as competitive rivalry. Um, and basically, the, first, uh, the, the, the way we describe it is with the first point. Uh, so first, know where you're getting yourself into. Um, you might have a very good idea, uh, and that idea might already be, be, might have been implemented in the place that you want to implement it as well. Uh, it might have many, uh, many barriers to entry uh, and to start up that you might not you might not know sorry um, you might find also people who might not want your idea to succeed so you have to scan or map uh, your situation to see uh, exactly who are your competitors how do they behave with each other and how how is this going to work um, and for example, the uh, competitive rivalry, the term rival is the one that Michael Porter took. And this is because he, he works in, uh, in, in an exclusively business, uh, like profit making business. When it comes to profit making, of course, we have to make profit because we have to be efficient. But that shouldn't be the only orientation of our idea. So this, this term of rival might, might sound a bit aggressive, especially when we want to improve things. So maybe we shouldn't have rivals. Um, if we are an NGO, we want to enter uh, like the the scope or the or, or the field where another and similar NGOs work. They might not be our rivals. They might indeed be actually our uh, uh, actors with, with with whom to cooperate. Uh, but still, if we have someone who would be our rivals or our competitors, 
for what are, are, are for which reasons are are them are they our competitors? Um, and this comes also uh, with who are you kicking out once you enter a market? Uh, sometimes we might mean very well, and let's say that we have the possibility of starting uh, an NGO that might take all the possible funding from the government. And we have the possibility of starting that idea in two different regions. In one region, there's already one NGO that has already, that gets, it's getting already the it's, uh, government funding and it's, uh, it's doing quite well. And in the other one, there's no one. So you could, uh, in that sense, you could consider, for example, uh, the impacts of entering the one that has already, that has already someone who's doing a good job. And maybe it would be better to join the, 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 the region that is a bit more idle when it comes to that. So maybe you enter that one and you collaborate in two different regions with another organization. Because sometimes uh, to, to improve some, something, if you kick someone, if you kick out someone who's doing already right, it might be, we might be doing more bad than good, but that's, that, that's very case specific and it's, uh, it's not up to me to decide. Um, but at the same time, when we are talking about that and we enter a market uh, or, a, or a field, who are your allies? Uh, who you who would you be working with? Who are your not rivals? And who who would be your mentors? Sometimes there are many small NGOs that take on work very specific than some bigger NGOs are already doing. And sometimes we are learning through a small collaboration, and those NGOs or, or people from those NGOs become our um, indeed our mentors. And we also have to value them and consider that we might need someone to guide us through the through the start of uh, of our idea and this is uh, and this comes uh, from porters and uh, uh, and uh, and and the way competition works uh, in general many times big companies compete through taxes so they make almost the same uh, profits but they manage to have this uh, fiscal structure so they don't pay taxes in in the country that they're producing the revenue and therefore they can have higher revenues and they can lower their prices. So they'd make a, a competition and make the, the whole rivalry must, much, much more difficult. Of course, that wouldn't apply to a small idea that you might be starting right now. And I don't mean small in a bad way. I mean, things have to start with a small thing. Um, it's, uh, it's where it's, we have to consider where we, keep, we pay taxes. And in, in that sense, I think we have to be responsible of how it works and and when when we should uh, if we have to start in an informal way because sometimes there are no other options we should start considering when are we starting to become more formal so we contribute to the fiscal system of our country um the second uh stakeholder or the second uh partner in the sense is a vertical integration or not or vertical line is uh, suppliers uh the people from from whom you buy we buy and, and depending on your idea, you might have very simple suppliers. I mean, if you have an NGO that is like basically a knowledge-based NGO, it, your suppliers might be just uh, people, uh, the transportation, um, uh, office, uh, office utilities, and so on. But if you if you have a product or if you're selling something that is physical, uh, you might have you might encounter something that is a bit more problematic. That is like when you're buying stuff. Uh, to produce your nice product to improve things, where are you getting your where are you getting your your raw material from? What is the carbon footprint? When we want to save, for example, twenty percent, how much does our carbon footprint increase? And carbon footprint is just one of the oh, of the oh, of the different uh, variables of the ecological footprint, which is a bigger concept that has to do with um, with water consumption. Basically, how much land we take to produce our uh, the, our products, um, and in that sense, uh, when we when we are asking ourselves this question, is like how far can we go regarding traceability of our source materials? Um, can we actually say that this is uh, responsible if we are producing something that has to do something with electronics? Can we say that like our electronic products is can we trace it back to a response uh, to a to a responsible sourcing, can we can we check some reporting from their suppliers? Do we trust them, or do we just take the the cheapest price? Uh, and I have to say here that is uh, sometimes we have no option, but at least we should be able to acknowledge 
that we cannot trace things and also re, uh, 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 tell our possible uh, buyer base that that's as far as we can go with traceability. Um, and another part that comes with buying from other people is how do we treat them? It's not just if we get good prices, it's like, are we being abusive towards them? Are we making any, are we paying unfair prices? Do we have unfair trading practices with them? And this is something that we have to consider and it's been already uh, very well uh, specified in the SDG number 12 on responsible consumption and production. Uh, next one is uh, it's not, uh, it's the, the people who buy from us. Um, so let's say that we have a very good product. Uh, it's very reliable. It's very good quality. And we meant this product to reduce inequalities, for example. Um, but in the end, uh, after making such a good product, we realized that it, this product is quite expensive or relatively expensive for the social um, base that we wanted to have. And in the end, we ended up, we end up, we end up uh, selling it to people who might, who, who was not our initial target. We wanted to make accessible food and then we make very responsible food for people in, in urban areas who have a lot of money. And that's something that we can still, and our idea can still be valid. We just have to be, uh, to make sure that that's what we meant in the first place. And uh, this triple F is like a, it refers to a social to a social base, which is friends uh, uh, and, and uh, friends and fools, family, friends and fools, who is supporting you in the very start of your of your idea. Apart from that, have you checked that they will be willing and they think your product is responsible enough to be to be your social base, despite a possible price, a possible uncomfortable price. Um, and the other thing is like, sometimes we make products and we, uh, we declare that when we make a product, uh, we're gonna, um, we're gonna use the revenues or part of those revenues, uh, to fight, uh, or to improve a, a particular situation. Um, so in that sense, when we are, we have to also reflect on how our products, uh, affects our buyers. That's our product. Uh, reinforcing inequalities uh, is if it's very segregating when it comes to uh, to money. Is it like do we actually <laughs> become uh, do we actually segregate people by that? Does it actually uh, exclude people? And that that can be different type of uh, social exclusions. Is it is it inclusive when it comes to people with disabilities? Are we making something that only few people can access? If so, it it would also be fine. But we have to be aware of that. And another one is like, are we basing our idea in consumerism? Are we basing our idea in people's, um, in people's insecurities, for example? Do we want to sell a lot of sustainable clothes out of telling people to buy a lot of clothes in the first place? Or to telling people that their clothes or the way they, they, they dress themselves is not, is, is not valid? That would be another question that we should uh, critically uh, address to ourselves. Um, another one has to do with once you are in a, in a field or in a market, there are people who might come in and, 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 have, and, and come up with the substitute. And we will see later on with uh, entrance as subjects, and now this is a substitute as products. So we might be doing a, product, a project, an initiative that is very similar to another, but we might be actually um, suffering from unfair competition on that. So, some companies, uh, some governments, or some even uh, civil society initiatives might have a bit more of greenwashing or social washing or whatever washing you want to say, um, meaning that they sell something that is uh, uh, apparently fair, apparently green, and so on. And you actually might be doing things much more responsibly, but still you're you're not reaching people as much as the other one that that does it in a in a less in a in a slightly worse way when it's like slightly less bad, good way. So how are you communicating your added social environmental value? And this, although we are talking of substitute, this is another stakeholder that we have to consider. And it's who are disseminating the, our products, our ideas are worth uh, people's time and efforts. Uh, in that sense, we might want to consider media. Uh, we want to maybe be, uh, become viral uh, if you manage to do so. 
uh, you might want to be become popular in a, in a very particular place, in a, in a village, in a town, in a region. Uh, you might want to be internet based and you want to have a lot of uh, interaction with social media. And, and another thing is like how we are transforming substitutes into complementary products or services. Some people might, might be producing or might have an idea that is very similar to ours. And, and maybe by just tweaking a bit what we're doing, we might be able to both uh, serve a particular goal. So if, if one project is trying to improve the governance of, of mining, and another project is trying to improve the, uh, the environmental aspects of mining, you might want to, instead of thinking that you are substituting each other and competing, you might want to take them in different stages. Okay, I deal with this and the other person deals with that. And it might be just a bit of adaptation from what we have that might not be costly. It just might be a matter of, uh, of being resilient and adaptive. And the other concept is uh, we mentioned once we are in the field, we talked about rivals and how that term might be a bit, um, a bit imprecise. And now we're talking of new entrants. Uh, and the first question, if we are in the field, for example, in the field of women's empower women empowerment, um, we might think that we should be the only one and uh, no, there should be no new entrants in that, in that field because otherwise there's going to be competition for that. But it's, if we think about that, it's like, are, are we sure that like with our initiative, we are actually covering everything that should be covered? Are we helping as much as needed? Do we have the capacity to solve the problem only by, our, by ourselves? That's probably not the case. So maybe what we have to do with possible new entrants is become their mentors and their possible allies. As long as we manage to have, and now I'm bringing this back, integration. We should, uh, integration when it comes to being efficient with our resources and possible new entrants um, and make this a win-win situation and trying to, instead of trying to push out people who want to compete with us, trying to bring them in and, and see how you can collaborate, of course, in a way that is not fixing prices or things like those. That would be unfair, unfair, unfair pr practices that, should, that are punished by law. And uh, but like when, it, when it comes, for, especially in social, social impacts, uh, we could actually do a lot by just coordinating with new entrants and with substitute products. And um, so I've been mentioning uh, bits and pieces of, uh, of what would be uh, bad examples of, uh, of a very nice, uh, young, uh, proactive, uh, popular idea that eventually might be doing more harm, harm the, than good. And uh, we can think, for example, of a very good idea that has a very solid revenue model, a very marketing system, a very market logical marketing system, very financial, very good uh, financial KPIs and so on. But we have to start considering uh, if, that, if that idea takes raw materials sourced from countries that cannot guarantee that people are treated nicely when we extract those materials, that we actually don't even know. There's no traceability. If they are hiring workers under poor, under poor working conditions, and, and this, this comes uh, not just to, to child slavery, but uh, there are poor working conditions for adults uh, and that, that come from not respecting the minimum wage, or in, in some other cases, even applying the minimum wage in countries where the minimum wage is non-existent or very low. Would, would, it would be something that is sticking to what's legal, but still it would be uh, doubtful, a bit doubtful in moral terms. Another times would be, another times would be uh, if you have the chance of uh, smashing and push out uh, possible competitors or people who might be doing things similar to you, although they might actually contribute, uh, contribute to improving things as you are, should you actually push them out or should you try to find ways so you, both of you cover different parts of the problem? Um, are you advertising your idea based on, uh, for example, racist, racist con uh, concepts of these people need saving? Uh, when you might be, the, it might be more like, uh, there should be more empowerment in these communities. Uh, are we uh, promoting insecurities to people? And I mentioned that, for example, uh, are we making a very nice cosmetic product that is very green and it's taking uh, these uh, 
formulas that don't harm animals, but at the same time, we're, are we telling women that they, should, they, they shouldn't age and so on? We should consider those things because it's, uh, we have different impacts on that. Are we promoting consumerism? Are we base, basing our revenue model on people consuming over what they need? Are we, are we producing, are we uh, manufacturing products that are difficult to recycle, that are different, difficult to, in the triage, uh, is it difficult to separate these different components? We should be considering that. And of course, and this comes from the, from the beginning of the presentation, um, even if it makes financial sense and it's being recommended by many uh, um, financial uh, experts, and even if you take uh, legal structures that might eventually avoid, uh, make you avoid paying taxes, you should be considering whether paying taxes is, is fair and whether paying taxes is something that you should do and instead of trying to avoid it with the complex uh, legal schemes. Um, so the conclusion for that is like, uh, and I'm sure many people might be watching this, it's like, okay, apart from all the problems that I had, you just gave us more problems and more things to look at and more things to make this more complicated. And to, to some extent, I actually agree. And, and this is because uh, you, we are trying to make things that are like almost uh, perfect. We are trying to help people to be financially sustainable, to give proper jobs, uh, and at the same time, be uh, responsible with all the stakeholders that we have to be responsible with. That's even more difficult than conventional businesses, and, and that's why you are in this program. Otherwise, you would just be in any, uh, any accelerator or incubator that, has, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with SDGs. They might be telling you to produce a lot and sell a lot and try to pay as, as, as little as possible to your workers and try to get as much as possible for your, from, your, from the people who buy it from you. But that's not what, you, what we want to do here. We want to improve things in a way that works for, almost, uh, for, for the most people possible and coming with the principle of leaving no one behind in an inclusive way. We shouldn't be promoting further exclusion. Um, but at the same time, uh, and although this is not going to be particularly easier than the, the regular way of uh, starting up businesses and, or ideas, there are many people who would be willing to pay this extra, or to do this extra effort to work for someone who are committed uh, to be your social base uh, of customers, partners. There are some people who would actually like to work with some uh, um, suppliers of resources that might be, they are traceable, they might be more expensive, but they, they would like to do so. So in that sense, uh, being responsible might make sense. Uh, and there's a niche uh, for people to join in. And there, there will be hopefully more people willing to pay fair prices for their products. Uh, and, and I think that should include ourselves. Um, so finishing uh, with the practical exercise, and uh, I've been mentioning that we have to uh, to reflect on and be critical to with our own ideas and how we approach them and how we approach the people that would be involved with that. Um, so the the practical exercise to you, because it's something that is basically an introspective exercise, is do a time capsule for yourself. Uh, there's been uh, questions throughout this presentation, critical questions that maybe while you're pre uh, preparing your, your idea, when you're working on it in the very early stages, you could answer them and think how you expect them to be, how you expect to be, how responsible you expect to be with uh, your suppliers, how you, do you expect to be with new entrants and so on. And at the same time, once you have uh, answered the, those critical questions to yourself, because that, that's, that's for you, um, and I mean, I would, be, I would like to have a look at them to make more critical questions or, or, or comments to, to your first impressions of a, on your time capsule. And the second part would be uh, a conclusion with, with two questions. What we, want to improve the, the, we want to improve the current reality or our, our reality or the reality around us with our ideas. So after taking everything, uh, after considering everything, well, we have to be able to identify the trade-offs and the benefits uh, from the socioeconomic and environmental perspective of our initiative. In the end, does it do we if we have to do a, a social cost benefit analysis, social environmental justice cost benefit analysis, is our idea improving things? Yes or no? 
hopefully it will and it's, it's probably the case but and and still we should be able to identify things that we are to improve something we have to do do something that might be detrimental for someone else and that's fine because still the system doesn't really allow us to improve everything at once and um and with that uh i would like to thank all of you for your attention uh, i hope uh, this presentation uh, prompts you to just uh, critically assess the possible stakeholders and partners that you might have once you enter the field or the market uh, with your initiative. And, um, and, and yeah, I hope to see you in the, um, in the forums and the Q&A and, and I hope that the, the rest of the program goes very well with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Javier. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, I think I think it was very clear in laying out sort of some of the challenges to partnership. It can take time to build trust and it can take uh, sort of human capacity to try to identify your, your stakeholders you want to work with. Um, I liked your point about, you know, to be mindful about how you, who you might be kicking out of the space. And I like the, your point as well, that the Porter's five forces is sort of a really excellent starting point at trying to map some of your partners. Um, but I want to remind our participants something that you said as well to also when they're going through their exercise, keep in mind about who might not traditionally be thought of as being part of those five forces who they might want to include. Um, I think it's great, too, that you showed some of the great strong opportunities and reasons why um, sort of collaboration can be really beneficial. So you talked about increasing your efficiency. You talked about needing good mentors. You talked about how it can increase your impact, um, particularly if you're looking at, you know, maybe somebody in your supply chain, building trust with them, improving their performance as well as your own, um, reducing risk by uh, sort of upping your social license to operate by making sure that you're not greenwashing something and that you're, you know, truly bringing about change. Um, and I agree with you as well. You made a point about how um, there are lots of people who want to work with businesses like this. Um, there was recently a study that was done on young people just recently graduating from high school and colleges and looking for jobs and how there's an ever increasing number of people who want to work for an organization that's doing good instead of just earning a lot of money. Um, which had been, you know, sort of the previous generation's objective. So I'm glad you highlighted that as well. Um, that was excellent. It doesn't look like we have any questions. Um, give everybody one more minute to text. But if we don't have any questions, I will remind them as well. Another thing that you said, you'll be logging into the Babeli platform for the next couple of weeks, looking at um, people's homework. And if they have questions, they can reach out to you directly through the Babeli platform. And with that, I think we will close here. Javier, thank you again so much for sharing your time and expertise with us. And we look forward to seeing all of you and your assignments completed on Babeli. Thank you very much, Lauren, uh, and, and in general, the SDSN youth for having me for this presentation. It was, it, it was my pleasure, and I'm looking forward to interacting with uh, the rest of the uh, participants in the platform. Thank you.